I have Sophia Esperanza down here in Southern California. It's so good to have you here. Welcome to Wake the Fake Up. How are you? Thank you. I'm great. I'm great, and I love the name. You love that? Wake the Fake Up. Let's like wake up. That was the whole point of it. It's like, let's get something and move something and shift something. That was the whole point. That's where we got it. Yeah, it's great. Okay. Yeah. You are in Southern California right now. How's that feel? I mean, I was here for seven years. I lived here, so it just feels, it's like a second home to me. Even before I moved here, I always knew California was one of my many homes. So yeah. I just kind of groove back in when I come here. It's amazing. You're a Texas native, right? Yeah, from Texas. Okay, and, and you're back to Texas. Yeah. You're loving that freedom move. Is that kind of how you feel? Yeah, I I love, I mean, I there's so many components to anywhere you go that you can love and then certain things that ruffle your feathers, right? That's anywhere. And I think where we are right now, kind of surrounding the Austin area, it's a nice blend of so many different kinds of people, ideals, and um and the terrain just feels like home. I love the heat. I love the humidity. I know how to deal with bugs, which is really just saying hey and not really deal with them, dealing with them at all. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> just yeah. Just kind of deal with them that way. Yeah. So bugs are full on over there. I have my my experience. <laughs> I I love insects. I mean, I grew up like playing with insects and mm -hmm. and examining them and learning more about them. And I love bees. I grew up mm -hmm. with bees and understanding bees and now we, we keep bees over in Hawaii so th yeah. there's a, a there's an innate intelligence there mm -hmm. and what, what I found with Texas is it's almost like Noah's Ark like the Ark was rebuilt and everyone went to Texas so it was like mass exodus out yeah. of California and how do you feel about that are you are you stoked on that as a Texas native that like hey everyone keep coming or are you like a Texas person where you're like uh I don't know no I mean I don't I I guess just like I have shed layers of identity and and really finding my identity in a word or a certain group of people or a certain ideal or belief. I don't do the same thing with where I come from. I have a lot of reverence and respect and admiration for Texas and Texans. And also at the same time, if I was born in Louisiana, I'd probably feel the same. I think it's all beautiful. There's something beautiful about everything. And at the same time, I do respect that there is that kind of Texas culture as well. Um, I just... There's home in everywhere to me. There's home in people. And I could be in a corner, a pocket of anywhere in the world. And as long as I have myself, I am home. So, yeah, I I guess I I was excited when a lot of people from California started moving over. And I know <laughs> a lot of people are not stoked about that. But I just think any time that you put groups of people around each other where there might be friction, I'm excited to see what comes on the other side of that friction. And I love integration. And I love conversation. And so... Um, if it makes people uncomfortable, uncomfortable creates change. And I'm all about, all about change. I agree with you on everything you just said. I was just having that conversation about friction and, you know, some of the most crazy ideations and thought systems and philosophies are the culmination of friction, mm. right? Because if everything's just running on the same sedentary line, we're never really jumping outside of our comfort zone. Yeah. And we're never really like having to figure out how to handle this, how to tackle this and how to get better. Yeah. And so I, I love how you frame that. That makes total sense. Are you looking at your back, you're, you going back to Texas as like, okay, I came to California. I, I saw through the other lens. I was exposed to X, Y, Z. And now I'm going back to my roots or <clears throat> is it just an, an alchemy of sorts, your evolution? Yeah. I feel like, um, well, like I said, I don't know if I said it before the, the cameras are rolling, but I always knew I was going to end up in California at some point. I knew this was a second home to me. And so I think living in a really conservative area where things are really similar and my critical thinking skills in terms of belief systems and philosophy wasn't really flexed and challenged, I knew that I would like to experience the other side of the spectrum. And so I kind of went from one seemingly extreme to another and placed myself in the middle of Los Angeles. And I saw the beauty in both worlds. And gosh, like how the blending of both could create so much balance and harmony. And I do find beauty in those two kinds of sides of the spectrum. And I also realized that the spectrum goes not just left and right, but up, down, all around. It's everywhere. And so I think this returning for me was just a closing of a chapter of what has it been like seven years of living in California and moving in to every different pocket, Venice, downtown, Sherman Oaks, West Hollywood. I've lived all over and uh, experienced so much. And now it was, okay, I saw it all. 
I feel like for me right now, I'm getting a little distracted because it's so exciting here. And this part of my life is to really go inward, to listen, to learn, and to have less distraction and stimulation. Not that Texas is boring by any means. Austin is beautiful. And we're living in a more suburban area where we get double the land for half the price and the home and all of that. So I just wanted to um, stimulate a bit of silence in my life in order to hear myself more and to integrate all of these things that I've been learning um, for the last 29 years. And if I look at it like I am this and this person, and I have many different lines that draw from me, and it's all my connections to people, and I had so many in California where I was like, I love you all, and I can just feel the weight of that. Um, there's just always something to do, always somewhere to go, always something happening, and uh, while that's all exciting, this part of my life, my Saturn return, if you will, is just, yeah, it's a closing of a chapter, so I love ha- Texas. Anyway. Hallelujah. <laughs> Like going back to Tejas for the silence. Yeah. It's like your large, winded, big state Vipassana with a lot of civil, civil liberty freedoms. Mm. And I get what you're saying. I feel it. Growing up in Southern California, you know, I didn't grow up in LA. I grew up in San Diego. But there's always something to do. There's always something to stimulate with. And that's living in any metropolitan city or anywhere that it's crowded with so many different options. And as as beautiful as that is and engaging as that is and so many different people we can meet and cultures clashing and all that stuff. At the same time, there's no, it, it's very difficult to step away from that and go mm-hmm. inwards, you know, and we're, we're, you know, we're creatures of habit and we're seasonal too. There's something to that. Like I practice the Taoist immortal faith-based system of seasons. So right now we're in the winter equinox. We're still in the winter season. This is the time to go inwards. Mm. And that's why people do Vipassanas and do all these things is so they can kind of turn off all that noise and figuring out some kind of form of art and purpose from within. Mm. And I feel like that's something that you're, you're going towards and that you also want to cultivate within you because there's so much right now that you probably have no ideas coming your way and that's stuff that's inside of you inherently do you feel that do you feel like you're like an artist like who's just starting to brush everything out I feel like you know yeah I've lived 29 years and really I'm just beginning and I feel like this last year really um put a like a stick in the sand it was like and we're starting it's right now um isn't that exciting so exciting I was I was just talking about this earlier like Last year, I really started to wake up every single day, stoked for life every single day. I don't know what exactly happened. I guess it, maybe it was a culmination of many things, meeting my husband and um, walking into living a more authentic life and expression and doing trauma work and becoming lighter in a lot of ways and also taking life seriously. And also it's just like the biggest joke. This is like, it's so serious and it's so hilarious at the same time. It's everything. And I just, I stopped carrying around the weight of so many things that I didn't have to. And then the journey became that much more fun. And with a lighter baggage, you can go so many more places. And so now I just feel like I'm just starting. And yes, I'm freaking excited. <laughs> <laughs> I'm stoked for you. You know, the rebirth is real and we can have rebirths all throughout our life. Mm. And it's like, for me, it's like, there's moments where it's like, aha, it's either go this direction or go that direction. And a lot of people tend to block that aha moment out mm. and they're not looking at the hyper synchronicities. And it's probably because they're not living in their, their Dharma, their chosen destiny, if you will. Mm. Right. When we start living in like our true purpose then we start seeing synchronicities and we call those hyper synchronicities. And when you start seeing them all of a sudden, you know, you start seeing numbers, you start seeing things that start working out for you instead of like, keep hitting that wall, keep hitting that wall. And I, and I feel we're so in this like tight area of escapism Mm. and pain and suffering. And I'm sure you've seen it all around you and and been through it too. You you were through it. So let's just jump right into that. So you, you moved to LA and you were, um, you were, a model, mm-hmm. you're an actress doing all kinds of that kind of that, that material world. Yeah. And you got, st- you got fell into a crowd, I'm sure. And you got mm-hmm. stuck in some kind of, you like know, willingly walked into it. Willingly. So, so wh- why'd you choose that? Yeah. So it's super, it's so funny. Cause so my friend Deepa, who's here right now, she was the first one who brought up human design to me and it's been around. This isn't anything, you know, this didn't just happen yesterday, but a large portion of my life, first 29 years have been 
other than school, because I wanted to be a doctor, I was like super, super about school and science and math. Um, other than that, if it wasn't interesting to me, if someone brought something to me, like a certain idea or belief, and it didn't resonate right off the bat, I would listen to it, but also just be very aware that I'm on my own path and I only have a certain amount of a capacity to absorb. And it's been like that for a long time for me. And so because of that, um, I think people would assume based off the way I live my life that I'm really into astrology or I know about many different things and philosophies and philosophers and ways of thinking um, because of my expression. And that's just not the case. I came into this world feeling a deep level of connection. And that's just the way that I came into this life. And I feel like when my friend Deepa brought up human design and then you said, what is your human design? You know, like you should learn more about it or does it make you curious? Um, it was the first time in a long time where I actually was curious about diving deep into just another world. And this 29 years of my life has sparked a curiosity to learn and to absorb. And when I actually went into my human design, it said the first third of your life, you'll try on many different versions. You will like almost neurotically just try on so many different versions. You are gaining perspective. You want to know how it is to be every single kind of human and live every kind of experience, which has been my life. And then at about 29 years, 30 years, you will tend to go more inward and you will want to learn and you will want to be student, pupil, and then the last part of your life that you integrated for a long time, that's when you become teacher. And it was so crazy because the thought of all of that came before I read the human design. And then it just basically affirmed everything. What is your human design? You have a two in it? Or? I am a, I'm a manifesting generator. Okay. Four, six. You're a four, six. I think. Yeah. Okay. Um, that's like networking opportunist or something like that. Okay. I don't know. Um, but yeah, it just made, it just was really nice to read something like that and just affirm versus telling me this is what's going to happen. It was just a echo of what's already going on inside of me. And so this chapter of my life, it's like, I just see this, like bringing myself to my knees. I, I want to be brought to my knees. I want to be humbled. I want to um, have rushes of humility. I want to dig deep and find out where my ego is just like throbbing. Why? 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 Why, why are you, why are you thirsty for this? Why now? <laughs> what did, what did you do the past seven years? Well, before that, um, so I guess we were, I actually kind of jumped around. So when I was living in Texas and before that, I, I guess just a large part of my part of my life, I've been trying to feel something. So I lacked human connection a lot growing up. No one really understood me I didn't really in your find in your like in your immediate family everywhere everyone. everywhere okay. yeah so I kind of I yeah my childhood is unique just like all of ours is and um a beautiful one at the same time and feeling so alone throughout my entire process of just living life so my mode of connection was the tree the ant the snail the leaf everything outside um and inside of myself and so I really lacked connection and tried to find any mode that humans, which felt like different than me, I would say humans in my mind, like I wasn't one. And we're just trying to find any mode of connection, which was um, first, uh, I guess, food, and then it was gossip, and then it became drugs, alcohol, sex, anything that I could do to connect for a moment, just to feel like I was seen or was on some similar wavelength. And that was a large portion of my life. And so I ended up actually um, running nightclubs in Houston at a really young age and was leading like all of these different nights and was very much in like the control space, controlling the experience and putting on things for people. So I already had my hand in that way of, or that industry before I even moved to LA. So I was kind of primed for LA in certain ways or the LA nightlife scene. And then I moved to LA, got into modeling, and then ended up dating someone for a long time who was like basically LA nightlife. He was just kind of running the show. And um, because I dated him, it was just a, I'm now a part of this scene in this life. And I saw so many things and I met so many people. And um, the reason why I willingly entered those spaces was because I feel like I was still gaining perspective and knowledge. And I'm a very empathetic person, highly sensitive, highly emotional. And I like to live people's experience through 
living it to really understand. And so I feel like I've done a lot of that. And I wanted to swim to the deepest deeps and see the craziest things and do the craziest things to really come back from it, hopefully alive, yeah. to then be able to help heal myself and help heal others. So. And how did you eject out of that? What was the what, what was the reason? You just there was a moment where you're like, Yeah, this is it. There's two things for me. Um, I actually grew up, I was one of those children who pushed the food forward and said, I don't want to eat animals anymore. Um, there was just something inside of me that I've had since I was little um that not only didn't want to eat animals, but um had a very visceral reaction, like lose control of my body when I would see an animal being harmed. It was it's it's me. This is my soul. Um, it wasn't learned. I came into this world this way and everyone kind of around me knew that I was different in that way and lived vegetarian for a long time as a young child. And then at 13, just kind of started doing everything. That's when I was self-harming and, and just kind of entering this new chapter of myself. And the, the thing that brought me back first to my true nature was seeing footage from a factory farm. I was about 18, 19. I saw a dairy cow being suspended from a crane and even if it doesn't seem like that experience can relate to my own, you know, of coming back to true center, it, it totally did. Seeing suffering, seeing truth, someone else's truth, really made me question my own. So that was the first thing. Having a few uh, near-death experiences, for sure. <laughs> um, and also watching other people's near-death experiences and having a newfound appreciation for life and this beautiful experience that we have. And I also think coming back with certain, I don't know if it's abilities or sensitivities from the near-death experiences, but I definitely came back different. Are these near-death experiences like just being caught up in a scene that's so hectic and chaotic that's taking like the body to the limit? Drugs. Right. Mm -hmm. Okay. So just like kind of the nightlife energy of just going hard for mm -hmm. days on end mm -hmm. where the body just at some point might not, just the heart just out. stops beating. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Right. Yeah. Okay. And I had a near death experience before I even ever did a drug. I almost died from viral meningitis when I was about 13. Oh, wow. Which is actually when I started to then do everything um, in my life and started to self harm and all of that. But I was near death. You contributed that, that experience, viral meningitis to maybe a spark into that opening into that world something happened that's I, a spiritual experience from what i've researched yes. yeah yeah i think i think that's when something changed in me for sure and i had this um i really don't know what happened i, I think like I a think shadow it, it, it think it really heightened my sensitivities to life like i think any everything is an energy shift and when I came out of that experience, first of all, when I was near death, um, I could hear my mom at the end of the hospital hallway, like door shut, huge room, all the way at the end of the hallway. I could hyper, my, my hearing was hypersensitive. I was on my way out. And so I could hear things like that I shouldn't be able to hear as being this, this human in this body. And so things were shifting. And so when I came back from it, I feel like, yeah, it was just never the same. And that's when my shadow work, if you want to call it, really began. You were just like F it at that point mm. and just went for it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I've heard of that before. I've personally felt that before. That's quite the experience. Mm -hmm. And that's a, um, you know, viral meningitis. If most people don't know, that's an attack on the, the brain and the central nervous system and the spinal column. Mm -hmm. And it's debilitating. How long were you suffering with that? Was that like a month? It happens fast. Um, yeah, it just came on. Yeah, it came on. And Is I actually... Is it an infection? That, that, do you so think? you get bacterial or viral. And I had right. viral. Bacteria is, bacterial is even worse. And yeah. many people do not recover from bacterial. Um, yeah, the swelling of the meninges. So the most immense pressure in the brain. And I just remember telling my mom, it's okay, I'm going to go now. Um, it was that much pain. And I remember telling myself, if I recover from this... I will never experience this level of pain ever again. So everything that I ever experience in this life will be just fine. Just remember that this is the worst pain you've ever felt. You can handle anything. And so that's my spectrum of pain now. So when if I ever go to the doctor, like, what is it, 1 to 10? I'm like, it's a 0.5, you know, <laughs> it's fine. Wow. Because <laughs> it was so bad. Um, relativity, right? Everything's yeah. relative and that's perspective. Yeah. It's awesome that you hold on to that mm. and not just like throw that into the old memory bank. Like it's really part of like your ethos and, totally. and how you move forward. Yeah, and I actually got viral meningitis after uh, uh, I got a vaccine. So um, 
Whoa. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Now we're talking. So which vaccine? Tell me more. School vaccine. So it's like one of those combination Like rounds. a whooping cough vaccine or they like... They had just implemented something to go back to school and I had to do some round of vaccines and um, I know meningitis was one of them. It was a combination and uh, yeah, that, that happened pretty quickly after. So who knows, you know, but... Um, how do you feel now? What, where are you at right now physically, just physically, before we go into the mind and spirit? From the meningitis? Yes. Or yes. That definitely lowered my, like, at 13, that, I used to fake um, wanting to miss school. Like, oh, I have a cold or I have a cough. Can I stay home? And when I turned 13 and when I got viral meningitis, when I recovered, I never had to lie ever again about getting sick sometimes. My immunity was shot, just yeah. completely shot, or, or just brought to a new threshold and that was my new normal. And so, um, yeah, I feel like that rocked my body big time and the lasting effects are ever present. Um, so I feel do you get, like, do you get like fogginess and do you get to points where your, your energy level just drops out of nowhere? Yeah. I mean, I've, I, I think I attribute, so I have autoimmune as well. Um, what autoimmune are you dealing with? Autoimmune these yeah. days, right? Um, well, I had vitiligo and I actually stopped eating gluten and my vitiligo not only stopped in its tracks, but I started to repigment. <laughs> so from, gl from stopping gluten, just one thing, gluten. Yeah. Interesting. So your body was having a, probably a massive infl inflammatory response to the gluten mm -hmm. and you had dysbiosis in the gut. Your body yeah. just couldn't properly digest that protein mm -hmm. and it allowed your skin to pr produce melanin. Yeah. That it, is interesting. It's crazy. Yeah. Huh. It's, it's, it's so interesting. Like once you, if you listen to the body or if you treat this life as an experiment, which I've, I kind of, I come from, I love science. I love math. That was my background. And I love controlling the experiment to really get a solid answer and versus going, I'm going to try 10 new things and see what works. I like to control things. So by controlling the removing of gluten, I was really able to see like, not only did I repigment and, and things were better, I felt, I felt incredible. And so, um, yeah, that kind of like illuminates the topic of truth and just like diving into why would gluten trigger this kind of response? What's in gluten? How do we create, you know, like there's, I think one of the things that really draw me to your page and your work is just this, um, this uncovering of truth and this curiosity. And I was born with so much curiosity and um, I still have it today. And just like, what a fun thing to uncover truths. It's, it's never been work for me. It's like, it's a privilege and a blessing to even have that spark to want to uncover. So I really resonate with that. And so all I'm doing in this life is just trying to touch on more truths and uncover more things for myself and hopefully for others too. This is the, my, probably my favorite part of our conversation. And this is a conversation between me and Sophia. We're not sitting here investigating each other and interviewing each other. We're just having an open-ended conversation and really getting to know each other. I'm investigating you. Well, we're, we're, well we're, we're bo we both investigate. So you talk about human design. I'm an investigator. You know, that's part of my design. I'm a one-three yeah. generator. And everything you just said, I resonate with. 10 billion quadrillion percent because mm -hmm. we're, we're so stuck in this. Someone's going to save us. Someone outside of us is going to save us. The government's going to save us. This political party is going to save us all, whatever it is. It's all bullshit. We have to save ourselves. And that comes through the investigation awareness and having knowledge and awareness to back your investigation up. So you're making mm -hmm. the right choices. Mm -hmm. We are we're chemistry experiments. We're spiritual experiments. We got to go through that process. That's the true scientific method. Mm -hmm. And this whole thing where everything's linear makes absolutely no sense because somebody's medicine can be somebody's poison and vice versa. We all handle things different. Mm -hmm. We have different systems, different microbiomes, different this, that. Our immune mm -hmm. systems are operating different. So I really appreciate that you you're, you know, you're holding on to your true essence. And by you, by you, like embodying that es essence as an investigator and wanting to learn more and control your own studies and control mm -hmm. your own experiences, that's how you're going to make it through this life without going into the situation where 15 years you were suffering mm -hmm. or 20 years you were suffering or five years you were suffering. At the end of the day, our lives are finite in these bodies. We're not in them forever. And so like the longer that we can be in freedom, mind, body, and soul, the more we're going to proliferate and just expand and do the best shit ever. Right. At, at the end of the day, like for me, it's, I, I don't know if it's for you. I want to hit like 
peak peak potential mm. i'm not uh, everyone's like sharing are you trying to live forever <laughs> it's not about that yeah. it's not about that it's just like i want to hit a level of mastery mm. and challenge myself that's mm. why we jump in cold plunges that's why we do the crazy shit that mm. we do are you are you like ready to step into that realm are you there yeah and i think um i w- one thing that i wanted to touch on too as you say that is i've been recently reflecting on just the many different types of people there are and there are people who are just so gung-ho and so spirited and like we talked about spirit animals you know lions tigers and bears birds of prey like there's these energies these really strong energies and um I think a lot of times because of the the era that we're in where there's this you know there's dominating energies different eras and and they lead industry and and systems and all of that, um, I actually appreciate that energy. Um, and also recognizing that I can be inspired by that in my own way as I'm snail energy, as we kind of touched on too. Yeah. So in my own way, um, I am forcefully, powerfully gentle. And I think in the times where I tried to see that this fire that I have inside is needing to also be, um, I don't know, also paired with that kind of masculinity, if you want to call it that, or that, um, just ferociousness, ferociousness. primordial, primordial fire. Yeah. It's, I respect it and I appreciate it. And I also know that what sustains me over time is the gentleness. I am gentle. I am soft. I am also a force and I'm, I'm, I'm fierce. And so I think I've really just come a long way of acknowledging who I am and my power and how, um, like my baseline. And yep. so I am, but I'm ready to snail into it. <laughs> I'm, you know, I like... respect that. And because you know yourself, mm. you're not going against the grain and that's mm. really important. And the snail energy. And I think, I think we all embody all these characteristics. It's yeah. just a matter of like, where's our comfort zone? Yeah. What are we used to sliding into? What, mm. which one do we throttle with? And I, I like the snail energy in ways where I can take my time and really just observe. Mm. But that's just one small segment of me yeah. where it might be more of your capacity and more of your comfort zone. We're all different. Mm. Yeah. I have feminine energy just like I have masculine energy. You have feminine energy just like you have masculine energy in you. It's not labeling. Yeah. It's nothing. It's just really being able to like handle things mm. as they come to us as opposed to like trying to just always react to stuff. Yeah, right? life can be very reactionary. I talk about this a lot. Um, are you living your life as just a pure reaction to everything that's happening? Um, I started. Are to, you? <laughs> well, at a certain point in my life, I'm sure, and I'm still figuring out ways to kind of um, acknowledge that where I am doing that for sure. To say no would be such a lie. There's there are part, parts where I do that, and I feel like when I reflect on when I'm doing that, it's when I want to connect with someone who's different than me, who's existing in a different space or frequency. It's you know. I want to talk about all these different things that gets our mind going and people would rather talk about the shirt that Kim Kardashian is wearing. No shade to Kim Kardashian. I'm sure the shirt was great. Um, (laughs) But um, in order for me to even interact, I have to then talk about the shirt or or go, why do you care about the shirt? No one wants to talk about why they care about the shirt. But I, um, yeah, I guess. Let me just, let me articulate what you just said. Because it's it's beautiful. Look, here's the deal. If someone's a hyper-materialist, and that's their their realm, and those are the things that fascinate them. God bless them. Mm. Like that's your that's your world. And and I, I want to be clear because there's a lot of stuff going on in the community, in the spiritual community, in this community. Mm. It's a lot of judgment, a lot of pointing the finger, a yeah. lot of this. I've done it myself. I mean, it's just we go through these phases. I think what you're saying and what, and what what I feel is that God bless anyone that wants to be part of that. You're just looking for something a little bit different. Yeah. You're, you're looking for a little bit more substance outside of that. Those things are cool, but it's like, okay, let's let's go a little bit deeper. Let's go a little bit deeper and let's find places that we can get uncomfortable with mm. and really like bring things up and yeah. evolve with it, right? Yeah, totally. And I think um, in the moments where I find myself wanting to engage in that way, it's really because I want to connect. Like I want to connect with everybody that I can. And if that's the mode... Um, that's the mode. And so I guess I'm trying to consciously shift the mode of connection, which then becomes a friction point if people aren't quite ready, or it might be perceived as coming from a place of, you need to be where I am, you know, I, oh, you know me. Um, And that's not it. It's just, oh, I freaking love you. And I want to just talk words with you. Can we talk other words, you know, anything, anything else? Um, And I also 
lived that experience for a long time where I talked about the shirts and the things and you did that I totally did it yeah that's part of your phase yeah and it's it's the journey you know and it's all beautiful and if I didn't do that I wouldn't be where I am today and um so yeah I respect and I appreciate it all and I just noticed that in the points where I'm not living in my truth or when I am reactionary it comes from a place of wanting to connect to other people how, how did everyone you're in your sphere of influence like because for me I've, I've kind of been in this realm pretty much my whole life but i've also had different pockets of friends i'm kind of mm. a chameleon in that sense you know i'm like i can go live in the jungles for a month naked somewhere and but i also want to go stay at a five-star resort mm. and, and live it up like that it's yeah. like it's just i, I see the beauty in, in this mm. life like you said earlier this is the cosmic joke it's the cosmic giggle we got to have fun in these bodies and experience but how did your immediate sphere of influence or, you know, your audience or whatever the hell it is, how did they re- receive that? And wh- wh- what was that like? Did you get people that were like, what the fuck's going on here? Or this is, is this real? Or what, what, what's happening? How did that, yeah. how did that take on? Well, I think social media is so layered. You know, what we put out is not always how we're feeling, how we are authentically wanting to express. And so for a long time, how I was creating content and the image that I was putting out did not reflect who I was on the inside. So it might look like it just a stark difference from one day to the next. Things just change, but this has been a gradual budding that's been happening inside of me for a long time. And so... So the clock didn't just start ticking at midnight one night. It was a process. (laughs) Yeah, it was a process. And I mean, and and my past partners could echo that, you know, because it's usually the things that were friction points. This is going to make you lose brand deals. This is going to make you lose jobs. You're going to lose all of your followers, blah, 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 fear, 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 which is also a form of love and protection to not wanting to lose something that I've built. So I really struggled with wanting to express authentically and also wanting to have my job and my things and have stability, which is something that I've not had for a long time in my life. Like stability is a huge part of my life. And so... Of course, you're a snail. I'm a snail. You need to be in your shell. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah. You like that? Yeah, I do. Okay, good. Write that down. (laughs) Um, But yeah, I just... I just... um, yeah, it's always it's always been there and it's always been something that I think my partners really see in me, which is so awesome to be seen. And so I've always felt like that's been held in relationships to a certain degree now more than ever. And um, I think eventually I just went, who cares? Like, I'm tired of checking in with myself and then thinking about what how it's going to be perceived. I want to check in with me. How do I feel about this? How do I feel about this post? How do I feel about wearing these things, you know, coming at it from a very like, I don't know, physical, shaving your head, shaving my head. And then which I want to talk about. Okay, cool. Yep. Um, and just doing it like I could die tomorrow. I could die as soon as you could, you could hack me as soon as I walk out of here, you know, like why not? <laughs> I'm not hacking anyone. <laughs> but I, I, I totally get what you're saying. I, I literally was having this conversation with my CEO today. I was like, at the end of the day, fuck dude, we're taking our last breath whether it's tomorrow or 40, are we going to care about this bullshit? Mm. We're going to care about what this person thought over here. Mm. Like, it's just, it's so crazy how we put so much energy and focus on that and think that we're, it's, it's the, it's an illusion of the highest order. And so do you, are, is your liberation level at a whole all time high right now? It totally is. And I think I've also brought empathy to that version of myself that wants to think about other people too, because just like a, a super organism, right? There's multiple beings together working together at the same time. You can even call that what the my, the the mycelium network, you know, if yeah. you will. It, it's. Did you just say super organism? Yeah, that's so crazy. Last night, I did. I went on a deep dive on super organisms. It's kind of like if ants are trying to survive like a river or something, they all bind together and turn into this big like ball of ants yeah I've seen, right? oh yeah it's so that's cool that's a super organism right, right? it's a connection and force it is and i feel like what we've actually been doing instead of looking at it from such a i don't know negative standpoint which i have for a long time and going oh we're all do, you know we're all doing this this thing and it's so non-productive i actually have brought a lot of empathy to it going oh my gosh we're all just trying to not make each other upset and we're trying to tiptoe around things and we're trying to just create our version of peace even though that's not really my idea of peace and I actually see a great deal of beauty in it and the version of myself that just wanted to appease people even though that's you know not 
the first version of myself I would pick because it really was thinking about what other people would be comfortable with. And that comes from a place of really loving everybody. And so unconditionally, unconditionally. And so I now am just figuring out that if I do this more authentically, then you obviously give permission to more people to do that authentically and to really see who we truly are and, and challenge ourselves. Can we love that? Or do we all have to fall into these certain categories to be loved? No, we can wildly express ourselves and be so different and still love each other at the same time. So, um, yeah, it feels, it feels very new and it feels very refreshed and I feel very liberated. And usually when I would talk about these things, there would be like this other entity in myself, like filtering what I was saying or wanting to be perceived a certain way. So I was constantly checking in as I was speaking. And now I just feel like a free flowing stream. There is no checking in. There is no like spell check. It's just my truth. And that feels like the most refreshing way to exist, just being a free flowing stream. Absolutely. That's self-love operating in your free will. Mm. And that's part of your design. And that's inherently part of all of our designs. It's like how many of us have been cut off at the knees of our own self you know, expression. Mm. And that's, that's trauma from childhood. That's trauma from school. That's trauma from our first relationships and onwards. Mm. And I can, I can feel it like just your, your, and you know you're you're stepping into this like new formed identity of your true self so it's not even like this thing that you had to get to it's really your raw soul you mm. know because we, we incarnated here with full freedom it's just somehow put the the mask of the maya on and we've lived in a false reality totally yeah. and i looked at this picture and i when you pointed to it because this is your energy and i also went and i really resonate with these guys down here and how do we how do we show that this is also just as powerful and just as beautiful and just as, you know, like it's all, it's all beautiful. And I don't know, I look at this picture and I think it's just so cool. Well, let's, let's talk about this because, because this is a very interesting uh, picture here Mm. and it can be perceived many different ways. Yeah. Right. So probably what the first perception is, is that, um, you know, being the alpha around a bunch of brainless, you know, wussies that have nothing to say. Right. To that's, some people. That, to some people, yeah. right? That's not how I perceive it. How do you perceive it? Well, I actually I actually see the lion as the force that could use it to shred up all of these sheep, right? Sheep? Yeah. If it wanted to, or protect. And so um Boom. I see the be- steward and protect. Yeah. And bring them into their lion. Mm. So I yeah, it's just it's it's harmony. Um to me in a certain way. And I think, I don't know the last time I saw a lion standing in a herd of sheep. Is this a real picture? But I, but I think just the energies, yeah, it's like, um, in a sense too, this is one thing. Like to me, this is, this could even be me, right? These are parts of myself where also this thing comes out when it needs to and to protect myself. So I see the beauty in all of it. That's, that's, you hit it right on the nail. We, we all have some form of this embodiment, whether it's the alpha lion in this dark, dark, dark energy or with the, with the sheep, we all have been places where, you know, we're, we're just kind of caught up in the wheel of society and Mm. society's kind of pulling us along, Mm. you know, we're, we're, we're in a system right now, Mm. you know, as much as we want to renegade out of it, we still pay our taxes, we're still involved with having to pay mortgages and mm. we're part of these things and we're in this like debt slave, you know, amnesia wheel running around. Mm. I think that, you know, at the end of the day, like a revolution needs to happen. That's just my opinion. Um, but while we're here, it's ease and grace and it's finding balance in our health, mm. our happiness, our friends, our network, all of those things. And to see someone like you that has jumped into lost angels you know, that's what I call LA mm. and into Babylon and was able to go through that entire experience and just be where you are right now. I hold a lot of respect and reverence for that because I've seen that yeah. town chew people up, spit them out and turn them into a worse and worse inversion of who they ever were. I've mm. seen that. I've seen the de-evolution and what that town can do to people. Mm. And you were right in the epicenter of it. Yeah. And I think, um, to be honest, I think being so um, involved in that scene or that lifestyle, but being coupled with my partner at the time who was so 
like, like the one pulling the strings of LA nightlife and, and all of that, it put me in a different seat. So I feel like I was protected in a lot of ways and I didn't get um, trampled on as much as I could have. So I watched a lot of people funnel through and, and again, just so empathetic for that experience. And, um, wait, I want to say that was a really beautiful point you just made. I mean, the level of sincerity and empathy to make that comment is received by me, mm. you know, that just so we're clear, you were saying that you were almost self-guarded a little bit because you were in a position based on the relationship you were in and the, just the, the kind of separation outside of the hard hardness of it. Yeah. And you're able to ease and grace through it and have a good time and have a, you know, epic ride, able yeah. to get in there or anywhere you wanted, hang out with the coolest people, go to, go to this thing, go to that thing and, and just ease and grace in that, in that regard, as opposed to people that are really, really fighting to stay on that line. Totally. Cause the, I think something that could be thrown around was, you know, Oh, look at all, look at this person who got themselves into this situation or can you believe that? Yeah, I can. Because if I wasn't sitting at this table with this experience, that probably would have been me trying to figure it out. And yeah. so, um, yeah, it just taught me a lot. And, um, I came out of that experience with so much perspective and even in my moments of judgment, you know, um, I always came back to, wow, that could have been you. Every single person walking around could have been me. We could have been each other. We could have been living that life maybe. And so, um, it allows, it allows me to ease the pressure in my mind and the judgment and, and just the ugliness that can kind of arise. And really what it comes down to is feeling like I'm better, um, superiority. Uh, and yeah. so I, I don't want to feel that way in any tinge of that. I have to remind myself, <laughs> bring yourself down, you know. Totally. That could have been you. I, I, know, I know that feeling. Do you, can you remember any, like, certain rise, I call, I call mornings rises, um, where you had a crazy night, You've been up all night. You might have been on drugs, whatever the hell you were doing, where you just looked at yourself in the mirror and was like, what the fuck am I doing? Did you ever, did you, can you recall that? Many times. Many times. Yeah. And it, in, in those moments, were you telling yourself that this is just temporary? I'm just getting my fix in. This is leading me into X, Y, Z. Or were you in complete self-denial and self-hatred and, and pain? No matter... And this is something that I don't, I'm not sure everyone experiences. No matter what vertical I've existed in, industry, space, version of myself, uh, the amount of drugs I've been doing, I've always been pretty self aware. So that's been something that I've been able to. to Which might have been worse. <laughs> to be self aware. Well, in those moments, right? Yeah. Um, and also. Also, when you're self-aware and you're doing these things, yeah, it comes with a certain level of guilt and reflection. It's just constantly happening. Why am I doing this? And I think what I kept landing on was um, this is temporary. You're experiencing something. You want to understand it. And also kind of, I don't know, taking the pressure out of why and just flowing as I'm going through all these experiences. Um I wasn't too harsh on myself really until I think I came out of it and it was really just for the amount of time that I did it for. It was like, you didn't really have to stay in it for that long to understand. Maybe you didn't even have to do any of that to understand at all. Um, maybe that was a bit of a cop out because you just wanted to keep existing in these spaces and um, maybe- You were having fun. Yeah. At the end of the day, like, let's be real. Yeah. You were having a good, it was it was a, it was a good ride, yeah. right? Yeah. And I stopped- um, so it really went from me doing, I actually started doing drugs really early. I was 13. And so. What kind of drugs? I was doing ecstasy at 13. Okay. Um, didn't really do much else, but I did a lot of ecstasy. Like, took, What do you consider a lot? Uh, five. So you're taking like five tabs of ecstasy While I was taking night? school uh, exit tests for school, making like hundreds. Yeah. Wow. So you're exploding your serotonin receptors. Mm -hmm while taking exams. Mm -hmm. So it became almost like this is how you were getting by. I just wanted to be stimulated in school. I was so bored. Um, <laughs> I would finish my work early. I, I really, I loved school. I loved learning and I could retain knowledge, um, really well to take tests. And so, um, yeah, I was really bored in school. And so I was like, why not take a test and feel tingly? 
Uh, do not recommend it. Mm-hmm. That's what is that ninth, tenth grade? Yeah, I was in high school. Okay, interesting. Or middle school. Yeah. Um, tried that a little bit, and then had a few years where I didn't, and then went full blown in the last part of my high school year. So it was really about like sixteen where I went full in and was doing like tests and being in school. Were you in the whole festival scene and and all that stuff, or just this was just your local nightclub? And doing more, drugs with friends. More nightlife and by myself really more than ever. You're uh, taking ecstasy by yourself. Yeah. Yeah. Interesting. Mm-hmm, interesting. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. No, no. Because I, I know that I know MDMA very well in terms mm-hmm. of its components and how the, that compound works. And mm-hmm. it's like SSRI, uh, understanding how serotonin is upregulated and how it's being released. Mm-hmm. It's full on. Like, I mean. Couldn't go many places. So. Um, are you depressed a lot? Super depressed. Yeah, okay. Yeah. I mean, I was going through it. There's a lot there. Um, sure. But used to do it to bond with people. And then when I wasn't allowed to go anywhere, then I just did it by myself. Um, and then it became, I wonder how it would feel doing ecstasy while doing this other thing and just coupling these experiences and just trying to, I think I had a, a bit of a thrill. Uh, uh, I seek thrill a lot. So I would do very dangerous things, um, not carefully, which is fine, I think, right? Um, so you're a snail. Who's on ecstasy, <laughs> looking for dangerous things? So but I'm like, just picturing this snail like going down a cliff, tripping on tripping balls, <laughs> with like the eyes. You know how snail eyes come yeah, out. So, all right, so that's gonna be a new art. I'm gonna make this. I'm gonna draw that. I'm gonna draw you as a tripping balls snail. <laughs> that's me. And the snail's like fire ratio too, so it's gonna yeah. be like really trippy. Wish I would have found. You know, Did I you mean, throw acid in there. Huh? Or was I there, have done. Okay, acid. So yeah. Later, those? later. It really was ecstasy. And when I say all of this, I don't know who's listening. Um, but you know, I don't recommend. Uh, there are different ways to heal and to feel and to feel connected, obviously. But that's my story, and I used to shy away from it from a long time for a long time, and now I embrace it um, fully. Because I'm alive, I'm here. There's also a lot of cautionary tales within it. And I would not be the person that I am today without all of those experiences. And the reason why I did them wasn't, the reason wasn't all so bad. I really just wanted to feel. I wanted to feel loved. I wanted to feel bliss. And when you lack that in your experience growing up, um, no matter if people think they're showering you with that, if it's not if it's not real to you or if it doesn't resonate with you or if you're not being seen, um, how can you really be loved if no one knows who you, if no one knows who you are? Um, they don't see you. Um, they're loving an idea of you, what they want you to be. And so um, for me, it was, you know, maybe not the best, but therapeutic in certain ways um, just to have control. I had control over that. Yeah. And so now, I, I could know. see that as a control thing. Mm-hmm. You were under control with it because you, it was on your terms, mm-hmm. right? And you can engage yourself in self-loving and lo- and that and that energy that comes out. I mean, MDMA right now is is being worked on depression cases, mm-hmm. suicidal cases, things like that, relationship stuff. Yeah, you know that's a real real compound. And I have to say that going through my depression period and after you know self medicating, whatever you want to call it. I really did come out on the other side healed in certain ways and also damaged in many other ways because I didn't know how to do this or if this was the mode for me to heal at all. But I can't lie that something did change in me and I did feel a void being filled um, that I had been searching for for a long time. So um, it sparked my interest into the plant medicine world. I started to, um, I did acid you know, just, I mean, oh my gosh, it was... Uh, when you did when you did LSD, lysergic acid, diethylamide, what happened there? It expanded you? Yeah, so that's actually um, when I saw the footage from the factory farm and then I did uh, LSD. Um, acid's LSD, yeah. It is, um, yeah. And um, yeah, so that happened. Which is actually a fungus. It's, mm-hmm. it's yeah, most people don't know that. It's a, yeah. it's a good... It's the same thing. It's very similar to psilocybin, just Chemically. without the spore energy in it. Crazy. Yeah. So crazy. Um, yeah, so I did that. And um, that, you know what it did is it made me feel the way that I felt when I was younger that I've been trying to get back to for so long. And it doesn't mean being seven or any of that. It means I remember so strongly how it felt to be authentic before things started to really mold me, shape me damage me, make me go inward. And experiencing LSD made me feel my true essence again, a tinge of it, or at least, yeah, parts of it. And so 
it lit a spark in me not to go do more acid or to keep doing things, but to really integrate that experience. And for so long, I had exploited different chemical compounds and experiences, sex, alcohol, all of that. And I went... Which are all chemicals in themselves. Right. All addictions, all things, those are all chemicals. Right. Yep. And I went, I'm going to do this differently. I'm going to integrate this. I'm going to figure out how this applies to my life. I'm going to reflect on this. And it was years. It was seven years that I reflected on that one sitting with LSD. And um, in between that, I have communed with mushrooms, which has also just been incredible. And before that, marijuana, all of it's been healing. All of it has been healing. And I feel like it's so interesting because everything that I yearn for in parents um, or connection through other humans, I have met face on with the plant world and the, fun- and the fungi world. That is what I've been <clears throat> searching for. Um, that's the gentle hand. That's the loving embrace um, that matched with me. Not that I didn't have those, but it's like it, it made sense. Yeah. Um, that was, that was, yeah, my, my world. That's very beautiful. We, you and I share a similar path in, in that sense. Um, not with the MDMA. Okay. But I, you know, I've expanded so much in the plant medicine world to the point where, you know, I've stewarded it and I've served it and continue to serve it. And it's just such a big part of my reality. And it's beyond just the psychedelic aspect of it. It's the root force of dissolving oneself and going back to the goo. Yeah. And that's really what entheogens do. They're, Mm -hmm. they're, you know, the ability for them to create the samadhi effect, the dying before dying within oneself and remembering who you are. And I'm all about the presentation, the initiation and the follow through Mm -hmm. as opposed to just the trip. Integration process is the most important. My, my time with uh, different maestros and my time learning the pharmacokinetics and pharmacology of these things is so important and the indigenous cultures from where they come from and my ancient roots being Persian you know there's a lot of medicine um, alchemy in that route and that was a big reason why I am who I am today so it's beautiful to receive that when you first came into our house you know where I think we were uh, someone was going to serve you a makuna and cacao and all this stuff and mm. you looked at us and said oh I'm on my dieta mm. and I asked you dieta for what are you going in the ceremony and you said you're you're leaving to Peru in mm. the next 10 days and Peru is a place for me and my family and our crew that we've done a lot of self exploration there through mm. you know grandmother ayahuasca and grandfather wachuma and those medicines are pivotal in my life you yeah. can see it growing in my backyard the Wachumas are I everywhere. Didn't you didn't see no. it. Yeah, we'll go back after Amazing. this. We'll walk around and. Sweet. Um, what? So, are you? You're you're planning on heading to Peru sh- shortly? Yeah, I leave um, in just about a week, and I'll be there for like nine or ten days. Um, Peru's pretty chaotic right now. Yeah, it is. So maybe that's uh, you know you come bring it, come bring the snail energy. Yeah. And the fire over it's there. Always like that. I'm all, I'm always somewhere where I'm, I'm like you know when they're like there's a zero point one chance or point zero one chance you know this could happen usually happens. To oh, interesting. Me. But it's like the good and what we perceive as the bad. You know, it's all of it. Um, and I'm so grateful to be in that pocket because that's where so much magic happens. So cool. Agreed. Um, but it's really interesting because. Oh, this is like, I just realized this is the first time I'm going to tell this story. And then for the rest of my life, I'm probably going to tell this story. Um, I'm making it bigger than what it really is, but it's important to me. Let's so, hear it. Um, I've had this vintage t-shirt that I just kind of got on a whim. I didn't read what it said. I just got it years ago. I love the color and I like the mountain that it had on it. Did not look at what it said. I got this shirt, wore it a few times, and then kind of put it away. And just recently, I was unpacking a lot of clothes as we just moved from Austin. And I was going through things that I was going to keep and then I was going to sell. And also for our vintage shop. And I went, oh, this is vintage. I'll put this for our shop. And I folded it up, put it away, still not reading what it said. And then we had a really cold day where I needed kind of a thick t-shirt. So without looking, I grabbed it, put it on, again, not reading what it said. And... I had a, a, a calling, um, to, to organize this, this trip. I was in the bathtub. I was like, it's now something is now. And so I connected with the beautiful woman who's going to be leading the ceremony. That's a whole other story, but connected with her, got out of the bath, put the shirt back on. She said, do you want to talk now? Is it fine if we, you know, kind of run through some things now? I said, I'm actually free. Let's do it. 
And as I was looking at the phone or FaceTiming or uh, WhatsApping, I read my shirt and it said Peru. And that's where <laughs> I was going. And I was like, no way. Like, I, I have not seen what this shirt said for so long. It's Cusco where I'm flying into and then where I'm going off from, uh, or Lima and then Cusco. But Lima, Cusco, yeah. Urubamba, Sacred Valley. So crazy. Yeah. And um, yeah, so it's just really interesting to me because it's a bright yellow shirt. It's like, who could miss it? me of anyone I could miss what it said and then it was just like it everything just made sense you know I felt the calling she could only jump on the call right now versus like days out I'm really all over the place so it just aligned in terms of timing we got out put the shirt on and it was just like yeah let's this is it will this be the first time you're sitting with grandmother yeah Mm-hmm. Is there anything you want to ask me or do you want to go completely free? I want to go commando. <laughs> <laughs> I have asked a few um, of my friends different things. And I also know that as much as I say, oh, well, I'll go in with no expectations no matter what anyone tells me. The subconscious, 95% is, you know, popping off there. So I'm sure I'm absorbing tons of things that people are saying in their experiences. And I really do want to try to limit my expectations. So I'd love to after talk about our experiences because I mean I could listen to ayahuasca experiences all day yeah. I think it's or just sitting with plants in general any plant I'm going to be doing wachuma as well and in, in a list of, of different plants and um yeah I just love the stories they're so potent and they're also unique to the person which is just so it's such a testament to the knowledge that exists within the plants each medicine is a little different yeah, they all hold uh, certain pathways to intelligence, mm. and they hold it with a different ferocity, mm-hmm. right? So I'll give you a couple broad strokes that won't change your path or anything. Okay. And hearing everything that you said today, which is really our main inauguration with each other, you and I had an awesome FaceTime together, mm. um, but this is awesome, really starting to understand a little bit more of your background and where you are today. Um, I think you're going to crush it in so many beautiful ways and roll yeah. with it because you're you're at a level of honesty with self, which is really necessary when, you know, integrating grandma ayahuasca. Ayahuasca for me is like the truth bearer. It's the really? truth serum. And she's going to love you and embrace you and hold you. And she's going to make you feel like you are connected to everything. And it's when you get to that moment of purging the energy. And I don't mean that physically. I mean energy, things that are holding into you. When you're not able to look inside of you and see the truth, that's when she starts to kick your ass a little bit. Yeah. You know? I want to get my ass kicked. Yeah. Well, you're going to get your ass kicked. <laughs> and that's that's part. That's just like yeah. anything else. That's part of the process. My, you know, the active compound in ayahuasca, um, and it has different energy signatures depending on where it comes from is dimethyltryptamine dmt Mm -hmm. dmt is um, an endogenous compound that's made in the brain some say in the pineal gland but it's also different parts of the brain it's converted from tryptophan right and dmt in my opinion this is a postulation is the spirit alchemy that transports the soul in and out of the body Mm -hmm. i think that i have a soul in this body i feel that yeah i know that 80% 80% of the world is religious and believes in heaven after earth and we're in different stuff. Mm. So if that's the case, that means the soul had to incarnate in the womb at some point and leaves the body at some point. Mm. It's under my belief system based on experience and understanding pharmacology that DMT is the chemical compound that transports the soul in and out of the body. Mm. That's why it floods out when you die. That's why it trickles when you go to sleep. Mm. That's why it floods the embryonic sac at a certain a certain point of pregnancy, all these different things aim to that. And when you take copious amounts in, whether that's you're freebasing it or digesting it like ayahuasca, you're going into that into that intermediary world. Mm. You know, maybe that you know in between stage. Mm. And it's in those in between stages that we can feel a glimpse of death. And it's that point where the ego, the false ego, the ego that's built on scar tissue and wounds and anger and frustration, mm. those start to wrap, start to dissolve. And we can come out like a fresh coat of skin, so to speak. You know, people get, yeah. you know, all that kind of stuff. So yeah. you're 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 in for an amazing, amazing ride. And then you said you're possibly doing Wachuma as well. Yeah, a few, a few different ones. Mm-hmm. Which is which is the ultimate. Which grandfather, is yeah. Grandfather. It's mm-hmm. it's just like sitting on your lap. It's like, here, let me give you a big hug. And let me just tell you everything's going to be all right. Just yeah. connect to your heart and be in your truth. And that's mm-hmm. a very powerful you know that's a that's a cactus right so it's mm-hmm. like standing firm to the earth and the the wachuma masters 
when I, I met the the Wachum, I spent time with Cucho. Cucho is the Wachuma master of Aguas Calientes, which is the the town of Ma, of Machu Picchu. This is in okay. the Sacred Valley, and I met him through the gentleman that you just met before this, David Avocado Wolf. I uh, love that name. Isn't that the best that name is ever? Name? That's a real name. That's so cool. Is that the best ever? Wow. So he's been doing retreats in Peru for the last twenty years, mm. and they, the, the, I mean, I I was. I was brought into that realm through him. And so Kucho is the most renowned, devout, you know, he's an ayahuascadero, but he's his, he's a grandfather medicine guy, right? Mm-hmm. And that whole area is where Wachuma is from. It's from Pisac and um, and um, wh- where else is it from? Uh, Chavin, which is in, close to my name, Chervin, mm-hmm. Chavin, that whole area is covered in the grandfather medicine. And it gives you superpowers. Like you can, like I, I was scaling the craziest <laughs> hikes ever. I mean, places that are so hairy and so ridiculous. Talk about like li- living on the edge. And it's just that medicine. You kind of, you, you take on its forces. Mm. And that's that sturdy, sturdy energy where... Wow where ayahuasca is a vine and it's mm-hmm. ropey and it's tangled and all that kind of stuff. And it's really interesting. I love, I love this genre of conversation because there's so much more. It's not just the psychedelic aspect. It's the life aspect mm-hmm. of how we mo- move and navigate through life and outside of just the trip, you know, the trip is just yeah, one part of it. Totally. Yeah. Integrating it. How are you going to integrate after? And I think that's something I've been really conscious of going into this is one, my background and how, I dive headfirst into a lot of things in the past um, and exploit things and my body, uh, chemicals, all of it. And so I think this is such a unique time in my life because I've healed my relationship with food. Um, I've healed a lot of relationship to... What relationship with food have you healed? I binge ate growing up. So most people would assume that I like was anorexic or something, but I binge ate. And I binge ate because I was really thin growing up and everyone told me I was sickly looking, I needed to gain weight. And so worried for me all of the time. So I ate 10,000 calories a day to try to put on some weight for about a year and a half. Which was definitely not serving you. No. You're not designed to eat 10,000 calories. Got it. No. Wow. Okay. So you went through that so, phase too. Yeah. I went through that. Um, got better as time went on and then... Uh, after I went plant-based, all these, you know, plant-based start things started popping up processes, processed this, did that for a year and was like, this is just as bad, if not worse. And also this is not what being vegan is about at all. So I'm kind of like a, kind of like a rogue vegan. Um, <laughs> I can't really consider myself, I guess, a vegan, more like an ethical vegetarian, I guess, if anything, if that's even a word, I don't labels words, who knows? It but... sure is. You just made it up <laughs> and I, I, I register it. Yeah. It's been something yeah. that I've been, I've been saying for the past two years, but I don't know what you know it can be perceived in many different ways and there's variations of that but that's what keeps coming up for me because I would go outside and find it totally okay to find a cicada shell that's been left over on a tree that has you know it's an exoskeleton it's gone powder it up make it into something to help with allergies but that's not vegan interesting so I'm okay totally, I'm I'm and just some minerals there too yeah yeah it's beautiful and okay. so uh, yeah, I mean, I'm wearing uh, vintage leather boots right now. Um, there's just so many things that don't align with veganism. And so I respect the group. I, I respect the ethos enough to go, I guess I'm out then. Um, you're out. And yeah. thank God you're out because <laughs> the isms is a problem. Mm. And it's so limiting and functionally me- limiting uh, on life. And ideologically, I have respect for someone who's vegan, but, mm. but that's your embodiment. Mm. Live it, experience it. I'll agree with you. Commercial meat agriculture is an abomination to God, and the, in the way that That's they're nice. do, doing that, I'm a yeah. I'm into regenerative farming. I know, I'm, yeah. You know, I'm I'm a biodynamic farmer. I understand mm-hmm. the balance of the sacred animal in the middle of the farm, and its ability to I would say turn everything on and make that make mm-hmm. the life force. Um, but again, int- intentions everything. How you do anything is how you do everything, which mm-hmm. is our motto over here. And I, I was curious, what what brought you to Symbiotica? How'd you find out about Symbiotica? Um, I was looking, I was at Air One, as you, as you are. Air, Air One, which is nowhere backwards. <laughs> nowhere, really? Yeah. I know that. Wow, okay. Write that down. Every time someone talks about Air One, I feel like we all have this like secret tattoo, Air One. You know, it's like, it's kind of, you know, culty the way we all flock to it. It's so great. Um, but I, li- I like Air One. We make a bunch of their products. They're Air good One. friends of ours. They're so good. Yeah. It's like, a, it really, to me, it's like a beehive. I just... 
buzzing around people all day. You, you go in feeling one way, you come out feeling 10 times better. Everything is just like mostly organic there. And anyways, I, I did a great deal of healing with food through Air One and the hot bar and just the juices and, you know, um, yeah, it's just been beautiful. But anyways, I was looking for a B12 supplement one day and um, it was the time in my life where I really started to look at uh, not taking the word vegan at face value and really started to get into ingredients and, and learning about what was in my food, what was in my supplements. And Hallelujah. Yeah, it's crazy. Um, vegan, the, the, that, that word can mean anything, you oh. know? Um, so yeah, that was actually what stimulated me to look on the back of this incredible B12 pump. And I did, and I was like, <laughs> wow. So I've been taking it for years, the B12. That's awesome. Yeah. We're, we're, that's one of our favorite products. We use that every, every day. It's amazing. It's pretty much a B complex and we're actually expanding it even further mm. to have even more B12 in there. And I'll explain that somewhere else, but that's awesome that you were on that. Yeah. I mean, and, and so we got to get you on everything else. It's time. I would love some of this. Okay. That's, I mean, that's special. This is great. Yeah. Yeah. We'll give I'm you the, all about the minerals. We'll give you the recipe on all this stuff. We got to get you on Sheila Jeet for sure. Mm -hmm. Sheila Jeet would be great for you to take down to Peru and yeah. that should not, that's, that goes perfectly with your dieta because there's no stimulants in there. It's just earth. Mm -hmm. It's basically earthbound compounds. Yeah. Um, I actually used to eat dirt growing up. That's so a good sign. yeah, I used to go take my shoes and drop them in the mud and then dry them and then eat them like chips and eat the, the dirt in the That's mud. That's berserk. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I loved it. And I actually found out that some pregnant women, um, I can't remember what groups of people, might've been the Aztecs, but they would eat it to draw impurities out of their body as they were moving through pregnancy. I'm going to go with that. Um, you know, it sounds great. Um, well, there's microbes in soil, I know. which is yeah. what it's called intrinsic factor. It's mm. actually what allows us to absorb B12 and other B vitamins. Yeah. Yeah. And without an organism. That's yeah. right. Without that intrinsic factor mm. um, or whatever species, we can't even absorb all that stuff. Yeah. And I think inherently my body knew. So I was vegetarian really early growing up. And so I was eating, you know, actually pescatarian. I would eat some fish sometimes. And I think my body knew inherently you need to go outside and eat some dirt. And yeah. so I, yeah, I'd eat dirt for a long time. So anything mineral based as we're moving into a really kind of depleted area, you know, the soil's depleted, our food is depleted. Where can we find these mineral rich um, sources? Um, so we don't have rivets in our nails and we, you know, our hair's not falling out. So <laughs> among 10 million other problems that yeah. come with that. Yeah. 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 That's really important. Mineralization is the foundation to health in my opinion. And it mm. goes straight along with hydration. Those two things work mm. in synergy together because we are electrical beings and without the proper mineralization hydration, we lose our electrical charge, which is our mitochondria totally. and then everything else suffers. It has nothing to do with protein, calories, or any of that stuff. Mm. That is a core part of being human and being mm. youthful. Sun energy, grounding energy, all of that stuff plays its part Elemental. in the perfection. Yeah. Elemental. Yeah, these totally. are these are inherent earth wisdoms that we have to understand. And I, uh, it's foundational for everyone, not just one person or one person. It's for everybody. Mm. Right now, what is what is exciting you? I know you're going to Peru, but what 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 are you stoked on? And just lay it all out. I am really stoked. I mean, I'm st stoked. You're stoked on life, stoked right? On life, man. yeah, yeah. Um, but but yeah. I feel like if I had to pull out a few things that are really on the surface right now, it's meeting so many people who, eh, not so, it's not about so much big like minded, um, but who are charged, who in whatever vertical they are existing in, and whatever way they're moving forward, they're doing it with a lot of intention, a lot of passion, and it's really well thought out. And I'm just excited. I feel like the last few years, it was almost like, um, you know, when you soak chickpeas, um, you pour water over them and, the, the, you know, certain ones float to the top. Um, and maybe this isn't the best analogy because sometimes the best, the, the bad things float to the top. But I feel like the last few years have been this like rising of the top because the times called for it out of necessity of Who's here with me? It's this new layer of... Line in the sand's been drawn. Yeah. Right? I've met so many people over the last few years that, you know, we, we're not bonding over being vegan. And again, I'm not vegan anymore. Um, but we're not bonding over this or that, the things that I used to bond over. Because I realized over the last few years that I have a lot in common with many different kinds of people that do many different things and live many different ways. And so this... Um, I guess this... The soul connections and yeah. the inherent connections 
people that are on the same vibration and that are yeah. moving in the same direction. That's what you're stoked on, right? Yeah. Because that's stoked. all I'm stoked on. Mm. All these other like successes, all these things are, are great and all that stuff. But at the end of the day, really inspiring people and doing it with my tribe, that's it. Mm. That's my core happiness. That's the core ethos of my direction. I feel I feel that's similar with you. And you're starving for it. Pushing forward and are the reason why culture shifts and ideas are brought forward and belief systems are challenged. Like that's what it's about. I see this time in my life as there's like a huge current and I'm not trying to go against it. I'm just trying to stand firm right now. I'm just trying to keep in a place so then as it washes down, I can start moving forward. So it's really about just first getting my footing and just being grounded and rooted in who I am and what I am and then moving from there. And uh, that's been really, really incredible part of my life so far. So I love that. I love where you're heading and I'm glad that we were able to connect whatever drew us in the universe, whether it was Air One or this I know person. what it was. What was it? So uh, quickly. So I... Uh, I was doing a quick email blast. It like came out of nowhere. Um, I wanted to send my email community a holiday kind of an, an offer. And I was like, oh gosh, you know, it'd be so great. Symbiotic would be great. Maybe we could do something together. So we started an email. And then my friend who's actually outside right now was messaging or we were we were talking in person about someone that I would really connect with. She was like, there's someone who uh, it's not vegan, but you and him would have a really interesting conversation That's around. the friend that you came with today. That's her, okay. yeah. And she was like, but I would really love to get you guys in a room to talk about this because he's a really, yeah, he's just really connected, loves animals and, and, and does the things that you don't, you choose not to do. I would love to just see this conversation happen. And I came across your page from a post randomly on the Explorer page. And just from your essence and the way you were speaking, I went, this is him. This is the guy she was talking about. So without, I without knowing for sure. Without knowing, I was wrong. Just to, just to throw that out there before you get all excited, I was completely wrong. <laughs> but I go, is this him? And she goes, no. But I also love this guy, and he he creates you know Sim Symbiotica is his. And I went, oh, I love Symbiotica. I'm actually emailing with them right now. So it all was it was just like just churning of different things. And then yeah, I shared a really important perspective on AI that I thought needed to be uplifted into the skies and well then well done yeah, that's you. right we did talk about this <laughs> yeah right when we talked was during that whole ai lens lens app all that yeah. nonsense yeah which i was a big you know proponent yeah. against okay yeah so then that happened and then we just started talking and so actually it really was deepa even if it wasn't the right person it was deepa who implanted that idea in my mind and then kind of got me excited so well <laughs> yeah go deepa go deepa <laughs> Eva's an awesome soul. I, I yeah. enjoyed her smile when she came in. She had really nice energy. Yeah, she's amazing. Yeah. Yeah. So I think we I think this was a really good first conversation between us. And I, I think and I, so, yeah. I feel like we're gonna have more. Mm. And I'd love to get involved with whatever you guys are doing in Texas. And this is like, you know, this is what it's all about. Our tribes are uniting. Mm. And we're here to do some fucking epic shit and have the best time ever. And I think that's something that needs to be recognized is that we can still have the best time ever, but we're doing it in a place with a little bit more sacred tendencies and some more sacred energy. Yeah. And that's like really where I'm finding myself drawn to over the last 10 years of my life. Because I was in the scene with you. I mean, I used to throw uh, After Hour Power at Avalon. I did. Oh, okay. I did the second Saturday wow. for two and a half years. Uh, oh. From 2007 to 2009. And even one year is a long time. <laughs> I did that for almost 18 months. Wow. Yeah, 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 exactly. And that mm. was hectic. And I was that was not my scene. And yeah. I was just into the music and just got Same. caught up. Same. Yep. The, the music for me, and that's something I really had to um, uh, meditate on a bit because I was like, I kind of just threw everything out with it. And I went, oh, there are really some great elements here. And can we fine tune them to where you're still bumping some incredible music, but it's hitting a different frequency and, you know, get you in a different headspace. So yeah, I totally jam because the music for me is like, that's everything. Yeah. Yeah. Music is life. Even not like the nonverbal aspect. I just found so powerful. I prefer the nonverbal. Yeah. 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 Mm. I'm, I'm, you know, we're, we're all into like kind of that tribal Middle Eastern house. That's trippy, mm. very like Tulumi vibes, Middle Eastern vibes, music. Mm. 
I'll send you some of my playlists. Yeah, you can check please. it out. Yeah. Yeah, my playlist is my name, Sharing three 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 on Spotify. And there's some really cool, cool sounds. I think you dig it. Okay, sweet. And I um, have some too. Um, yeah, well, let's trade music. Yeah. <laughs> okay, cool. <laughs> and let's let's well, maybe we'll throw a party sometime. Yeah. Have like an epic event. Yeah, I wonder what a party would look like when a lion and a snail gets together. <laughs> <That'd be> interesting. <laughs> yeah, it's gonna be uh, well, snails are salty. Mm, and and lions have a lot of saliva. Okay. Right? So maybe they can help each other in that sense. <laughs> yeah, whatever. Yeah. <laughs> I have no idea what alchemy that means, but No, but I do uh, like pickles. So I love pickles. Yeah, that that, that works too. <laughs> Um, I really appreciate you coming here. And I appreciate you as a human. So uh, thank uh, you. And every single person who's a part of this. So thank you. We we have the most epic crew here. We're we're in this not for any other bullshit. We don't need to be doing this. This is this is like something that was just more inspired, right? And we just feel like let's get some really good messaging out there. Let's talk about things that most people aren't talking about and have and come with a level of sophistication and energy mm-hmm. and frequency. And like for us, wake the fake up stands for that. It's just like let's just rattle the cage a little bit and get people a little bit uncomfortable and talk about things and have fun. And and that's really what it's all about. And for me, I'm used to being interviewed all the time. Mm. And this was good because I'm not interviewing you. We're just having a conversation and we're talking about life and having an experience. And that's really, um, for me as a listener, who's also experiencing, that's what I take. That's when I can take the most out of something and really absorb it into my life. Cause I'll be thinking about this conversation. I'm already reflecting on, you know, things that I was dealing with in my early twenties and mm. your, and your experience and where you're at now. And I'm thinking about where you're heading and all that stuff. Mm. And that's powerful, powerful visions to, um, to, to, I don't know, to lay forward. Thank you. Yeah. And it's, it's great to be around people in different parts of their life to really just share wisdom and to receive. And, um, yeah, I'm very much in that place. So just yeah, lo- would love to hear more of your ayahuasca stories after. <laughs> I'll I'll go into the toad ceremonies with you. I'll talk to you about five awesome. meo and a few other psychedelic compounds that are very very interesting. Um, before we go, tell me about your shaving of your head and what oh. that's all. Because I mean, at at face value, it's it's liberation. It's the opposite of what a woman represents in terms of mm. the long hair and all that stuff. And maybe that's what, why you did it, or maybe there's something deeper. What inspired you to do that? Yeah, um, well, I guess I, I've been wanting to do this for a long time, and it just was never the right time. And I was self-aware enough to go, when you do this, this, ha- this is going to mean something to you. So um, do it when you feel it's absolutely the right time. You could do it right now, and you could have some things stimulated from it, great maybe a little cathartic, but it could be even more potent if you do it at the right time. And the right time was just going to be when I just woke up and went, today's the day, and I really feel it. And so that's what happened. And it was right before my birthday this year. And so um, for me, um, this might sound a little harsh, um, but this is how I feel. I came into this world through you know, the the means what everyone does at this point before we're incubated in little pods, I guess. But I um was born. You can just let it low let yeah, it flow. Who cares if it's harsh? I feel like even though I was born from my parents and into a family and into a specific environment, it was a birthing maybe seemingly out of my control, right? Like I was brought here. Maybe I chose to be here right at this time. Who knows? But um, this was a conscious birth for me. So I have spent a really long time in my life feeling really disconnected and feeling alone to a certain degree and uh, feeling like out of control for a lot of part of my life. And so this to me was many things. And one of them was a conscious rebirth. This was me bringing myself back down to a level of hair that I was born with when I came into this world. Um, It challenged me to redefine what femininity is to me. And it also was an incredible experience just to release a lot of trauma and energy that I feel was trapped in my hair. I feel like instead of releasing this and becoming detached to my story and trying to forget it and to suppress it, which is where I have been for a long time in my life. 
It was a making peace with and I release you so you can return and become fertile soil that I now stand on to, to, you know, build me up from the ground up again. And so back into the earth, yeah, back into that. a biodynamic loop. And yeah. so it wasn't, um, yeah, at many, it was perceived many different ways online. And I think I just kind of laughed to myself because I was like, no one will ever know except me. And it's okay. It's perceived many different ways. And that was a challenge for me too, because I've been outwardly validated for a long time and I have pulled from that energy as a source of uh, steam. Yeah. You look this way, you're perceived this way. And so I thought and have realized that I actually did this for me. This wasn't to appease any group of people or to gain any kind of traction online or to do anything. It was, this was a, this is a st- authentic uh, expression of me. And, um, only I really know the depths of that, but that's kind of what's, what's coming to the surface right now. And it really is just a, it's a new chapter. It's a rebirth and it feels really great to touch my head. <laughs> I love buzzing my head. I have my head buzzed for a while and I, I just love the way it feels. And it's yeah. like, it's, it's, it feels so good. I tell everyone, you got to try it. I mean, there's so much going, this is, this is why we're able to have this experience that we're having right now. Right. And I, as women, we don't get to really touch the shape of our head to send love to it. And I feel like <laughs> since taking off my hair, I've been, I've actually learned how to touch better. I have been stimulating this part of my head now and loving myself and I hug better or I don't know if the word better is right, but I hug with more intention. I feel yeah, more, yeah. More interconnected. And so Sorry. it's just already the You're effects. rebirthed. You've, yeah. re- you've rebirthed. Did you, did you cry? Uh, yeah. Okay. Oh, yeah, I cried. Amazing. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I cried. Do you cry a lot? I do cry a lot. You do cry a lot. Okay. Yeah. Okay. I'm a snail. Yeah. A snail has to cry or yeah. it dries up. Yeah. We got to stay hydrated. <laughs> yeah. I cry a lot. I cry. I cry at like very, like things that people normally wouldn't even notice are happening. You know, there might be an ant that is missing a leg and he's trying to keep up with the three in front of him and he's just <laughs> not an eye cry. Um, but not so, not so much from a place of, oh, despair. It's look at him go against all odds. He's here. He's going. How beautiful. And I think there's a lot of projection in that. I, my mind, my vision, my, uh, yeah, my eye always goes to the small, the vulnerable, the weak, the 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 persevering one against all odds. And so, yeah, I cry a lot. <laughs> That's really beautiful. Thank you. It's the against all odds that is really like the motivating factor or the inspiration factor that's been used since time immemorial mm. in all stories, all movies, all stuff like that. It's like mm. David versus Goliath or the one that's just like showing up when they have nothing to show up with. Mm. And I, and I think right now, a lot of people need to hear these stories and need to feel into that. The, the empathy consciousness has almost all but evaporated in totality, in my opinion, in the collective consciousness, because it are just, we're so stuck in the material and the materials pulled us out of really feeling and cultivating these things. I talk about it with children all the time mm. that we're almost, we're getting to generation loss because they're not having to work for their food and, and, and get in yeah. the earth and see where things come from. Everything is just all electronic and shadowed into that whole thing. And when you don't have those building in you as a child, you're not building that faculty of empathy. Right. And this is this is really, really important. That's a whole nother conversation. So do you cry a lot? Um, I do. Yeah. I, I find myself out of nowhere, I'll just start crying, whether I, th- I have glimpses of past or thinking about my father or thinking about what can happen uh, with a family member or, you know, I, I get into those emotional states. I start thinking about my country, what's happening to Iran and the women over there and, mm-hmm. and all that stuff. But, you know, I, I cry about a lot of the weight that I hold on my back, you know, and it's sometimes I just have to have that cathartic moment. And I always feel a million times better. Right, a release. Cry. Yeah. I wake up crying sometimes from mm-hmm. just, you know, wild, wild dreams where I'm, I'm, you know, stuck with my dad and I know that he's gone, but I'm in the dream knowing that I'm having this experience with him. Mm. That happens a lot. 
You know, are your dreams pretty wild? They are. Mine too. Full the fuck on. I've been having nightmares since I was about seven. Wow. I uh, I don't I don't there, yeah I, I always no ask rhyme about, or reason. Just always trying to pull someone out of some situation. Life or death. Life or death every single time. I remember. I can like count on my hands how many times I haven't had a nightmare or high stakes. Really? Every single night. That's yeah. something that we should probably go into. Probably. One on one. Yeah. That's a Yungarian. So Carl Jung has gone deep into the sleep realm, into the dream state and the dreamscape, excuse me. And all of these are in- inherent experiences that are happening simultaneously in your life and probably some parallel realm you know for me dreams aren't just a a recap of a trauma or a recap of something totally it's really happening Mm -hmm. in this dimension yeah right and we were talking about the other night we wanted to watch inception i haven't seen that in a Mm. long time and dreams are a form of inception and they're not it's not it's it's certainly not just a projected recall and so there's something very powerful there for you. And it's not this thing that you have to overcome or it's just something that you have to realize and learn and draw from. Mm. That's that's what Carl Jung said. And I completely agree with that concept. Edgar, Edgar Casey said the same thing. He said that, you know, the dreams is, is the state where us to realize our purpose and realize there's a purpose behind that dream. And once we come to that understanding of that dream, everything falls into place. And we're now we move into another caliber of potentiality in this life. And it's not like some kind of karma you're taking on in the next. Right. So that's that's really interesting. I'd love to talk to you more about that too. offline. And yeah. maybe we have another conversation as that as that materializes into some new form of intelligence or awareness through and the I'm experience. Sure that night I'll have a nightmare where you're there and we're just like trudging through I'll be Atlantis. there. <laughs> I'll be there for you. It's crazy. In 2019, 20 21, 22, I would, I would receive two, 300 messages a day from people saying I was in their dreams. Yeah. I, you know, I get that. You get that a lot often. too. Yeah. And it's very specific the way I show up in people's dreams. It's totally. Yeah. Yeah. We need yeah. to talk about this. Let's definitely talk about it. Yeah. It's very powerful. Wow. Sophia Esperanza. Yay. It was so amazing to have you here. Thank, Thank you. Thank you for shining your truth and being such a reflection for me. And I hope that everybody was able to receive this in our full honor and just pure love and having the best time ever and all that, you know, that's great. this is what it's all about. Yeah. And I look forward to our future endeavors Me too. and, uh, I got your family's back and all their back and all their back forever. That's, that's my line right there. That's how I, that's how I operate in the full ferocity of that. And, you know, this is, this is really the, the Dharma that I've chosen and I'm just a, the cosmic goo of my ancestors that put me here. So I thank God for the experience and thank God for people like you. Same. <laughs> thank you. Yeah. yeah. Just um, grateful for all of this and just the space to be able to um, reflect on the beauty in every single aspect of who we are and our strengths and our truth. And I love it all. What a life. What a life. <laughs> so where can everyone find you and what project can they start keeping their eyes on? Okay. Uh, I'm Sophia Esperanza, Esperanza. On, Esperanza on all platforms. So I just have an Instagram and a YouTube, no Twitter. I don't know what to say. Um, <laughs> no TikTok for sure. I, I'm not Good. hip enough. Um, and new things coming up. Um, really, I'm just... I'm going to be sitting a lot and I'm going to be reflecting a lot, integrating a lot. And so uh, who knows what will come from that, but I know there will be a lot of sharings and um, I'll be transmuting in my own way and sharing uh, all of my experiences. And um, I have a cookbook coming out. Oh, cool. Yeah. Okay. A lot of, I have a cookbook. Um, it's going to be like cicada shells? <laughs> cicada shells, yeah. <laughs> well, I've been pushing it back, back, back because I each iteration of this connection with food, I'm like – that's not good enough. That's not good enough. I'm not going to tell someone to put vegan may- mayo on a... I'm, I'm not. Please don't. No. I mean, you can make your own from cashews. I'm so down for that. But uh, make your own aioli. But like, yes. Anyways, the bar just keeps getting set higher and higher to where I was like, I'm never going to make this. I'm going to... Everyone's going to have to have a rooftop garden. And that's going to be like the first chapter is like, first grow all of your own food and then you can use this cookbook. So anyways, now I've consolidated my thoughts and I'm figuring out how I can be really um, 
how it can honor where I am right now and also have some integrity in this cookbook, uh, making it something that uh, reflects my version of a balanced whole food plant-based diet in a sea of, oh, you know, just dense processed vegan food everywhere. I just want to- Gas, gas. You know what? I can eat beans all day. <laughs> well, you have the enzyme to break it down. I clearly do. Yeah. Many of those. I think it's some of the combinations of the, the vegan foods and the heavy, heavy nut butters yeah. and all that, that well, stuff. Well, you got to soak, you got to sprout. I mean, and yeah, these, yeah. Are, these are the Phytic things. acid, yeah. Yeah, just right. the things that we did. And when you don't, yeah, like uh, these are the things I, I really want to bring back to the surface because they're certainly not new. I didn't invent them. And um, yeah, just like pickling versus fermenting. Fermenting is incredible, and now we just pickle to try to kind of imitate that pickle uh, feel, which fermenting is, like, potent. We should it's... get back to fermenting and enjoy your pickling, too. But I just want to bring that back to the surface, um, and I'm really also honoring my lineage. There's a lot of indigenous wisdom that's being infused into this cookbook, so I'm going to be putting on a lot of different sources of where you can get um, your corn, your masarina to make your corn tortillas, hominy, heirloom grains, ancient grains, things like that to really also honor um, where my inspiration from a lot of the foods that I eat comes from. Your ancestors come from? I'm indigenous. That's a whole nother thing. Um, My lineage is pretty fractured. Um, Don't really know where I come from, but um, I know that I did my... I did my ancestry a long time ago. Oh, no. I know. They got me. <laughs> okay. We'll do a ritual around that yeah, and separate please. you Seriously. from the Matrix. Um, but yeah, I did that. And uh, I already knew I already knew um, that I was majority something. And uh, I think the foods that I just find to gravitate towards most to in this life are the ones that certain tribes of indigenous groups, not all of them, because not all of them were majority plant-based, but the ones that I resonate with, they were primarily plant-based and they made things a very specific way. And so I'm trying to infuse that into this cookbook too. To really, I love it. Yeah. I right. mean, that's everything right there. The indigenous way and what your what your bloodline is. Mm. That's epic. Yeah. Okay. So I'm going to, yeah. now you're getting me hungry. <laughs> I don't know. I hope you like my food. <laughs> <laughs> Anything that's fermented, I love. Okay. I'm all in the fermentation. Cool. I mean, that's the innate intelligence of food for yeah. the most part. And um, you will we'll open my fridge. You'll see a lot of that in there. Okay. But I'm starving right now, so okay, let's, let's go, go eat. Let's go. <laughs> okay. Everyone, thanks for being here. Have the best day ever. We love you. Have Thank the, you. Peace.